Welcome to Heart and Hand, the Rangers podcast, the podcast that likes to make jokes in times of trouble. This week on Heart and Hand, what's the difference between the Podders and the current Rangers first team? We all quite like being at Ibrox. Today's show is brought to you by Maitland & Co, solicitors and notaries. Now, of course, we hope that you never need to avail yourselves of legal services, but unfortunately, life isn't like that. And Maitland & Co are specialists in criminal defence and road traffic law, and they come highly recommended from heart and hand. They cover all over Scotland, and they deal with all types of criminal cases, including road traffic law. They appear in Justice of the Peace, Sheriff and High Courts. They are on call 24-7, because unfortunately you're never going to know when you're going to need a lawyer and they are available 24-7 for police station interviews, prison visits, legal aid is available, competitive rates if applicant is not eligible for legal aid and first interview is free. Maitland and Co have represented fans charged under the offensive behaviour at football legislation. So if you ever need legal counsel, the best place to go is Maitland & Co. Get in touch with them at info at maitlandandco.net That's info at maitland, M-A-I-T-L-A-N-D and co.net 07714 That's info at maitlandandco.net 07714 for all your criminal defence needs. So welcome to Heart and Hand, the Rangers podcast. My name is David Edgar. I'm your host. And joining me this week from the east, uh, two of them, in fact, I was going to make a joke about a, a type of weather that has recently occurred, but I won't do that because they're good and staunch. First up, Mr Cameron James Bell. Good evening, David. Good evening. Nice to have you. And joining me from pretty much near you, in fact, uh, is uh, a, a stalwart pundit of the Heart and Hand team. It's Mr Ian Hogg. Good evening, gentlemen. Pleasure as always. Saturday, Rangers took on Kilmarnock at Ibrox and turned in, I think, you know, without much argument, certainly the worst performance of 2018 from them. Uh, a performing of such stunning nothingness that uh, it, it matched the glacial temperatures at Ibrox where it was one of those days where, oh, eight or nine of them came under four out of ten. And we just... Yeah, the first 20 minutes was, I suppose, all right. Didn't really do much, but we are kind of winning the, if you like, the territorial battle. But after that, couldn't string two passes together. Players' control was awful. Players' passing was awful. Uh, They then started abdicating making any decisions in the final third, which led to just a lot of turn back and start again. When they did go through, you could see why they didn't want to make decisions. Um, Kilmarnock inevitably get a goal and inevitably it's Chris Boyd who scores it uh, poor marking from Russell Martin who loses him for the goal and we never really look like getting back although Martin nearly atones with a header from a great tavernier cross from a set piece but I felt Cameron that Rangers got exactly what Rangers deserved at that match 100% um, it felt a bit to me as if when you saw the players what they what you could loosely term passing the ball, it wasn't a case of being able to do it to try and penetrate. It was a case of I'll give it to you because I don't want to lose it. Yeah. Therefore, if I pass it to you, it's not my problem any longer. Yeah. Um, we were unfortunate not to uh, go against your your summary there, but obviously unfortunate in the first half with a Martin header which kind of flashed by the the goal. Uh, and that was it. That's pretty much the sum total of what was a highlight of. A game that I think most of us contracted hypothermia for the joy to watch. Uh, um, so, someone did suggest on Twitter that uh, when the players are watching the game back, that they should be forced to watch it in a freezer the way the rest of us were. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, probably, probably, and then throw water over them as well while they're watching it. Um, yeah, no, nah, dismal all round. Um, too many players. Having an off day, which, if I'm being perfectly honest, I'm getting sick of saying, I don't understand as to how you can't summon the energy, the motivation, uh, when you come out of the old firm game um, and feel like you've had a robbery, that you've taken nothing from a game that you've led twice in. 
Um, there's some real big questions for me about a lack of character in that team. Um, no. And I think to a man, they were a disappointment on Saturday. We'll come back to that. That is a big a key part of the home record, which we will talk about in a minute. But first up, Hoggy, I think Cameron is expressing a disappointment. We all felt that we were looking for a reaction and well we got one but it wasn't in the direction that we'd hoped that clearly the players arrived out there and after a six game winning run one defeat and it wasn't a bad defeat I mean it was disappointing defeat but they didn't get cuffed but one defeat completely knocked them off that run and completely changed their mentality 180 degrees and that is really really worrying Basically the whole team, and I mean pretty much the whole team, uh, turned in a, had, had an off day. Cammy, you nailed it. Fucking fed up saying that. Um, so maybe it's just not an off day. These guys just strike me as they come out of Ibrox and playing at Ibrox. The, the weight of expectation seems far too heavy for them. After, after losing to Celtic, you would have expected a Rangers team to have shown fight, spirit, pride in themselves, pride in their own performance and want to prove people wrong. There was none of that. It was instead what was dished out to a freezing Ibrox was just abject apathy. Um and I say a freezing Ibrox, I think we, we, we said in one of the Patreon shows, uh, David I'll share it with uh, on, on the flagship show. Uh, my brother flew over from Australia, arrived on Thursday. When he left on Wednesday, uh, Perth, Western Australia, it was thirty eight degrees. When he landed in Edinburgh, it was what, minus one. And I shit you not, on Saturday, the guy was dressed up for the Arctic, but still looked as if he'd had a stroke halfway through the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, such was the cold. The players the players need a damn good look at themselves. And, you know, there's a, we, we hear all the arguments all the time of, from maybe a wee bit more um, uh, optimistic supporters, I'll say, of... Celtic have, have a massive wage bill, far greater. They should be expected to beat Rangers, etc., etc. Our wage bill is light years ahead of Kilmarnock, where whilst Steve Clark has come in and done, frankly, a magnificent job at Kilmarnock to turn round a team that were relegation fodder. When you've got Chris Boyd out muscling, out playing, and just out thinking the Rangers defence. Something is worryingly, worryingly bad. Um, a friend Alex pointed out, and he's right here, that Rangers have had nine central defensive partnerships this season, which obviously doesn't help good stability at the back. Um, and I need to you know, like, be honest, other people will be listening here and, and disagree with me, and that's absolutely fine. But in the summer, I'd be moving Alves on. I've, I've not seen much at all out of him. And I think that wage could be better spent. I think he's he's really good in the air. And that's about it. He's slow. Uh, he sits far too deep because he knows he's slow. And I, I he, he he doesn't have the character, Cammy, that I was expecting him to bring in. He's a senior pro. He's got more experience at a higher level than anybody in Scotland. And yet... I haven't seen much of that transferring into Rangers and he seems to turn up, play, leave. Um, Martin, it's early, but so far I think he's, at best he's been all right. And it says something to me worrying that I still maintain that David Bates uh, is our best defender and he's nowhere near the finished article. You can say that the defensive partnerships have been a problem and th- there's a degree of validity to that argument. But um, the winning goal against Celtic came from our right-back being posted missing. And just at the start of the second half um, against uh, against Kelly, uh, again, same scenario, Tavernier posted missing. Uh, Jones tears in the wing be able to cut it inside. There's not a man near him and the guy just shoots wide and that was the clearest evidence if you needed one that Kilmarnock were going to hit us in the break the problem with Alves is he he cannot deal with anyone running at him with the ball at his feet 
If you want to put an aerial ball in, Alves will mop that up all day. Absolutely. And he did it numerous numerous times against Celtic. And listen, that's that's a great asset to have. I think I, what I wanted from Alves when I saw him coming in was a, a Davy Weir Mark II, where he could use experience to develop the players around him. Now, I'm not necessarily laying the blame at Alves door for that not happening because he's had a bit of a stuttered start. Um, he's appeared, not appeared, etc. He's obviously been part of that chop and change of the defensive partnerships. Um, I don't believe, though, that the players, the youth players in particular, like Bates, etc., have had that opportunity to play with them. And there's an element to that where, similar to Crancher, I think that we have to really seriously question why we are giving these players contracts when there is a question over their fitness. And Steve Clark did exactly the right thing on Saturday by um, just getting the ball at feet, running towards them, and every single time... Ibrox could feel it. I, I could feel it. It was palpable. Every single time someone had the ball at the feet, running towards Alves, all they had to do was take a step to either side and get themselves a yard, and Alves could not have, have kept up with them. Um the, the more disappointing thing for me, though, is if, <laughs> if you flip that scenario in its head and now you're talking about Chris Boyd and you look at this, the, the instance in the, in the first half when um, Doherty gave the ball away and Boyd was running through and Doherty, you know, had to gain on him, gained on him, overtook him and won the ball back and Boyd fell on his arse. That type of thing should absolutely shatter Boyd's confidence because he should realise that his legs aren't good enough to keep him up with his weight, certainly not either. Um, but he just kept going and he just kept himself in good positions and good positions, etc. And then he, he slotted home what for him is really a textbook finish. Well, Chris Boyd will um, be scoring goals like that in his 70s, Cammy, because that's instinct. And you're absolutely correct. I mean, physicality he doesn't have anymore in terms of, you know, as you say, the Doherty one was a great example where Doherty just easily gives the ball away. And I think that summed up Greg Doherty's day. That uh, he wasn't, he was probably the best Rangers player, but that he did a lot of good things and a lot of bad things. Um, and Terry's passing was was awful, but he won the ball back an awful lot, and that that summed him up. But yeah, Boyd could be scoring that goal um, forever because it's just about knowledge. And I think Martin loses him as the ball goes back out, which you know, I mean, Chris Boyd, he's he is their goal threat. He's the guy. Russell, Ma- Russell Martin's got no idea where Chris Boyd no, is. He's lost. You watch, if you watch, the, if you watch the go back again, what what to do is just keep your eye on Martin. See if he looks over his right shoulder because he should be on top of Chris Boyd, and that's all he has to do. He's got youth on his side, and I get the Boyd's physical. Martin is not small. No. So even if he even if he has to match him for pace, which I think probably one of the three of us could try and do, he can still keep him out of the game. And if you watch the goal back again, Martin Martin has got no idea where Chris Boyd is at that point. And you can't do that with Chris Boyd. You really can't. No. And fucking 90% of the goals he's ever scored in his career has been from being able to get an edge of space, losing his defender and then doing it. Yeah. He didn't lose Martin. Martin lost him and is a very key difference to that for me. No, that's, that's a good point. Going into the yes, midfield, uh, Hoggy, going into the midfield, uh, I'm a bit frustrated that Look, everyone, I, I could have named the Kilmarnock team on Saturday morning. Everybody could, and how they would line up. And we knew they would put three in the middle. And now the three uh, recent defeats at Ibrox to Celtic, Hibs, and now this match have been in large parts when Rangers have run into a midfield who just put three in and are stodgy in there and say, we are not ceding you any space whatsoever in here. And we've struggled badly uh, at times in each of those matches. And... I think now that Rangers have hit an issue with the formation, because Graham Murty obviously likes his 4-2-3-1 and was getting a lot of success with it, but the better teams and the better managers, and uh, yes, that does include Neil Lennon, much as it pains me to say it, what they have figured out is, look, Rangers are really strong on the flanks, and we have to accept that, and we probably don't have the players, even Celtic don't have the players that are going to cope with that. You saw what Candace and Tavernier did to Tierney, the other week where they just completely pinned them back and I think that these teams now are seeding that ground to us and saying what we do is we make sure there's absolutely no space in the middle and that makes it very difficult for us to play through and as our game is about short direct passing through there 
to try and work space. We really struggle badly to do it. On on Saturday, there was no space whatsoever, and we did only nearly get a goal from excellent deliveries from wide, which is what I think that the teams almost risk that they say to us, OK, if you produce a worldie of a cross, then you might score. But what we're going to make sure is that you can't play through us from midfield and you can't play through us on the edge of the 18-yard line. And Saturday was a textbook example of that. The amount of times that the ball broke down just outside their box to be returned to our midfield to break down again just outside their box was phenomenal. Do you remember a certain manager, David, that... um like to play one way that plan B was do plan A better that any time we had a poor result generally against one of the better teams in the league and probably a more competent manager we were always to learn the lessons and move on mm. That this is so spookily similar it's untrue that we've effectively got Graham Murty and I know he's he should only be in the job until the summer. Uh, I've, I've, I've said it. I, I don't think he should be the manager after the summer. Um, Graham Murty is showing, showing that he's got a preferred way of playing, or, or we thought it was a preferred way of playing. Recently, he showed actually that's his only way of playing. And his teams have got sussed. Decent managers have got sussed. Everyone knows exactly what he's going to do. Christ, Air United knew what he was going to do. Um, and took the lead, and we, we went on to steamroll all of them because they were blown out of the backside. Um, but better managers have him sussed. Celtic did it, Neil Lennon did it with Hibs, Steve Clark did it with Kilmarnock, Christ Hamilton did it at Ibrooks. Um, and when, when, they, when they go, when other teams go pretty solid and heavy in the midfield, and we are only playing two. Everyone knew how they were going to uh, match up against us or try to dominate us in the middle of the park. Yet nothing changed. Our key change was Cummings for Morelos. So therefore, we didn't really even have the physicality. Cummings tried his heart out, incidentally, but we didn't have the physicality up front. And therefore, it's no surprise that you know they won the midfield battle. They nullified us. Of course, it didn't then help that either abject apathy or just everyone had an off day and therefore forgot to do the basics. Saturday was just, honestly, you know, you look back at the, as you know, I'm not a big stats guy, but you look back at the basic stats, we had way more possessions, but shots on target was almost equal. They had way more shots on target, uh, sorry, shots overall were roughly equal. They had more shots on target than us, and we committed way more fouls than they did. Even though we were at home, they should be the team fight tooth and nail. Um, just, yeah, I, I, I don't see where Murty goes from here, unless he fundamentally learns his lesson. And it's that you know the the, the thing that Mister Warburton failed to do time and time again. Murty's got to do that and do it pretty damn quick. And. In the interest of fairness, though, I mean, we should point out that a big option is, that, that's been removed is the more defensive-minded midfielder due to injuries. That he's, you know, we've lost McCrory, we've lost Jack, who you're right could otherwise be coming into the side for certain matches. Uh, and I think that it's only fair that that we do point that out. But even with that, you then have to try and look for solutions. And I think that the worrying thing is. If I'm coming up against Rangers, then I'm going three right in the centre of midfield to to try and make sure that we get on top of them. Um, Sean Goss has gone off the boil the last couple of weeks, there's no doubt about it. And, he, you know, he's a good player, he he'll probably come back again, so I'm not panicking about that yet. I think some of our fans have been a wee bit baby in the bathwater with Goss, that he's went from being a wonderful player two weeks ago to absolutely hopeless now. He's not, he's probably... Maybe not as good as he was looking at the start, but better than he's looked the last two weeks and he'll find his level. But we did lack character and we did lack winners in the side on Saturday. And with 60 minutes gone, when Morelos came on and looked, you know, just shit out of form and confidence, I 
I, I mean, I wasn't alone. I'm not trying to paint myself here as any any sort of oracle, but everyone around me, Cami, was like, we're not scoring the day. And that that was the feeling. So it was, and, and um, Marty had said in his Rangers TV pre-match interview, he was asked, obviously, what's the thought process behind starting Cummins and dropping Morelos? And he, and he said, he was quite right with this, and he said... Um, Morelos has played a lot of games. I've spoken to him. He understands it, etc. Um, you know, he understands the decision. Jason has been playing well, etc., etc. And then he, he kind of said something quite interesting at the end of it, where he was like, "And you know, maybe Steve Clark wouldn't expect it." And I didn't really kind of think about that too much until probably after the game. And this is one of the things where I would probably protect Marty um, because if you're to ask, ask half the fans at Ibrox they probably would have said, I give Cummins a run out, let's see what he can do. Let's give him a um, a start and let's open him up a bit. Um, he can't push and pull defenders the way that Morelos does. It's not part of his game. So I don't think Murray can play a, 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 a formation with that, with Cummings at the top of it. I think he needs someone with him to do a little bit of the physical work and he will run onto balls. He'll create opportunities to do that. Where I think your problem with this is, and I think, I don't know if we're, we're overcomplicating what I think, very possibly wrong, is quite a simple problem. And a simple problem is being able to break down two banks of either four and four or four and five. And if you if you were to watch the entire game on Saturday, Kilmarnock actually left a couple of players up the top of the park when we were coming at them and coming at them. What we ideally need in that scenario is it has to. It, it, all the ball did was constantly move from left to right. Nothing was coming through the middle. And your issue when you're trying to go through the middle and almost play a little bit ticky tacky and try and just create a bit of space, similar to how Doherty set up the Murphy goal the last time, well, sorry, before the Celtic game, um, was just that killer pass right through the middle. Murphy creates the space. It's a goal. As soon as that breaks down, there is just this massive audible gasp of disappointment from the entire home support which no doubt leaks into the players but we don't have someone, I don't think a defensive midfield is a problem, I actually think we need someone who if you were to sit him in the middle of the park could vary it from either put out to the flanks to being able to try and find a, a short pass uh, or potentially a medium range pass that's maybe over the top and plays it into the, in, into the, the 18 18 yard box, maybe just as I say, between about 15 to 18 yards out from goal, and just vary up a bit. And what we're talking about here is a lack of plan B. The plan B is because we we are determined, absolutely determined, that a goal has to come from across, which is infuriating because you need to be able to change it up a bit. Because you saw command, that's all he simply did was just fold into two banks, and they were doing the same thing under Warburton. That as soon as you as soon as you're trying to get something out out of the game at Ibrox, if you just sat in and sat in, you would just absorb it. And then you stick someone with a bit of pace up top, as soon as you can clear the ball, get rid of it, let let the um, opposition striker take it away for a walk. And um th- there's no there's no variation to that play. I think where Murray got it completely wrong was taking Kandeas off. Because if he's gonna play Morelos and Miller and Cummings, why would you take off a person who probably gives you the best crosses in your team? In my opinion, I think by that stage he was at the oh, "we'll try anything" stage, and uh, you're right. I'm not going to ever go at him for playing Cummins because uh, I could see the logic in it beforehand. Uh, I was wrong, and so was he. Um, I'm quite openly admit I got that one wrong. So, but I'm not going to you know batter into him for it. With hindsight, it was a, a an error. A lot of our listeners will be saying, "Not with hindsight, David." I said it before the game, and, and you guys are right. And I, you know, I would, I would take my hat off there and say, take my hat off to you and say, yep, you got that one right, I got that one wrong, but I got that. Um, I didn't really get, as you say, the Miller substitution. He did do things that people have complained about. He, he made a substitution at half time um, where he brought Holt on for Goss. I think that was a wee bit deck chairs of the Titanic because I don't think it altered the issue. Yes, Goss wasn't playing well, but I think that. It didn't change the the, fu- the fundamental issue, which was Kilmarnock had the extra man and were 
therefore sitting on top of us. I don't think that that, that helped. But he did make the substitution. 60 minutes, he makes a substitution earlier than usual and does take off Windass, which is something a lot of people have complained that he doesn't do. He did do that. And then I think the Miller one was just, I'm going to try, see if you can get a goal. And I just, I don't think the Kandias coming off was, he could have taken half a dozen off, get it on form. I think it was just to get Miller on. But then when Miller came on, he was awful as well. I mean, there was an incident at the end that just summed up the whole game for me, where he found himself with the ball um, out on the the left-hand touchline and sort of harmlessly passes it into the side netting um, when there's guys in, in the box. But it was just an awful, turgid display. As I say, the players' control was... Garbage. I mean, really, I've watched it back this morning. The players' control and touch was laughable. The the passing was all to cock. And you can see them lose confidence throughout the match. They don't start with a lot. And you can see them lose confidence throughout the match. And then, as Cammy mentioned earlier, they just they don't want the ball particularly. And there's no belief at all in them that they're going to get a goal back. That's seven home defeats, Ian, this season, which is shocking and the reason it's so shocking is we we've never seen it in our lifetimes it's it's it matches the worst ever which is from 1914 under William Wilton and with three home matches to go unfortunately there's a chance that we're going to set a new and, and very unwanted record and that's I want to talk about that because there's so much I think that at play there now first of all there's the mentality of the players yes but there's also and I've seen people raise this point that the crowd at Ibrox do get on the players' backs very quickly and at times can be, you know, aggressive and unruly. And we all know, you know, that guy who who turns up and just calls them all pricks for an hour and a half. We know that that exists. I would counter that, though, with the fans turn up every week, pay money. These games are always a sellout. That was a sellout. There wasn't a ticket to be had. And they've seen seven defeats this season. And that's coming on top of what we saw last season. So the idea that the fans have to turn up and make, you know, this Borussia Dortmund style huge noise and TIFO is unrealistic. And the players have to accept, I think, that if they're going to use that as an excuse, i.e., oh, well, you know, the atmosphere is not great. Well, you're the only ones that can change it. It's as simple as that. Um, it's all right us sitting saying, well, you know, we'll do this, we'll, we can hand out flyers and we can you know try and raise it that isn't going to change it the only thing that will get that situation changed is results and there's nothing that you or I or a listener can do about it it's entirely down to the player so I, I, I think that's what I would call a Timmy excuse it doesn't wash Um, yeah exactly I think of, of those seven games and I think there's another two being drawn so there's there's nine games at home, nine matches um, that, that that we haven't won. Seven of them losses, five of them under Graham Murty in less than four months. Um, I think Murty's first home defeat was against Hamilton on the 18th of November, um, and for the thick end of one of those months, we weren't playing. Um, that's a uh, even just under Mr. Murty, that, that's a shocking display. Five defeats, seven defeats all season is shocking. Um, yes, the jersey weighs really heavy at home. You can see that. I think Cammy hit the nail on the head when he said the players didn't want to, to be the one to make the mistake. The players didn't want to take a risk. They were playing it sideways. There was no incisive passing. Um, none of the stuff that we've seen periodically... In, in recent weeks about both flanks working as units there was none of that um, can I see us going the rest of the season without another home defeat probably not uh, do I think that brings us an unwanted record probably um, and that that's to, to have that to have that many defeats at home yet probably still come second just shows you what a particularly shitty season that will have been. You know, you turn three of those defeats into victories and you're challenging for the league title. That that's how that's how rancid this run has, has been at home. Um and for me it really all points to David, you know, it, it's that lack of belief, the lack of just being Rangers players that but maybe you know, maybe it's to do with 
we, we scraped the barrel and brought in the dregs. But I really don't believe that. You know, we've brought in guys like Russell Martin, experienced experienced championship, stroke premiership defender, Scottish international. Um, we've brought in Doherty, who clearly has it and needs to develop it. We've got players who have massive self belief. Jason Cummings. We've had we've got guys like Josh Windass who has hid in the past, but has really come into his own. And we've talked about handling himself like a Rangers player. Same with Tavernier. You know, Saturday. I'm hoping Saturday's just a blip, but you know. Seven defeats all season at home just points to it, it simply can't be a blip with this team. No, but your, your problem, your problem with that, the reason as to why it's not a blip, is because of the players that you've just mentioned. There isn't a single one of them who would corral the rest of the players and kick them all up the arse to be able to try and solidify and strengthen our position at home. There isn't a single one of them who would turn around and just stand up, take accountability and say, this is Ibrox, you do not come here and push us off the ball, you don't come here and bully us, you don't come here unless you're willing to give everything in order to be able to get something out of this game. And the, the argument about being able to play at home and how the fans have got an, uh, an expectation atmosphere and stuff grates on me a little bit. And the only reason being is because if I was a fan and I was placed with that accusation, I would say, well, you're not supporting the team and because you're not cheering and singing and you know constantly... Um, you know, given that that noise level to the team to support them, I would throw back at them and say, "Well, I'll pick a number of players who I know are not playing for the manager, because if you look at the teams that we're talking about, I've got a degree of form. They're playing for their manager. Hibs are playing for him. I think Hearts players are responding well to Levine, and the, the clearest example was a guy in the opposition dugout on Saturday. They are working for that manager, and I'm not talking about guys who are world class players here. For fuck's sake, Effie Ambrose scored for Hibs." But he is coming on to a game because he wants to do well for uh, for Lennon. And these guys that we're talking about are playing well for their managers. And I don't think Marty's getting anywhere near that level of reaction from his players that makes them fear about going back into that dressing room when they come out with abject performances, the like of which they've been producing at home. I think what would worry me, um, and I'm, I'm with Hoggy, I hope it's just a blip, and I haven't made my mind up on Marty yet. I've gone backwards and forwards, but I'm going to stick to what I said, um, which is I'll give him to the end of the season. Um, but, you know, we analyse it week to week, so th- this is where I am today, may change. Won't change next week because there's no game, but may change in time. But I would be concerned that, like I say, that was one blip or one bad result and not a horsing, not a 5-1, not a, an embarrassment, a game they should have won okay they didn't and it was really disappointing but it wasn't I think something that should have resulted in the kind of spinelessness that we saw on Saturday and there is a concern that I have and as I say I haven't made my mind up yet and he could prove me totally wrong and I hope he does I really do but my worry is every time he's run into an actual football manager, he's lost. And different circumstances each time, but the result has been the same. And let's be honest, we can look at circumstances, you know, the week of the game, but then we're going to look at the overall picture and Hibs, Celtic, now this match, he's lost and lost convincingly. A uh, counter argument to that is a good performance at home to, to Hearts which unfortunately at the moment is the outlier. That's the problem. I can't use that too much in the defence because it's the outlier. Now, when people say, well, it's the players and there's nothing you can do, I normally don't really buy into that. I will say that Saturday was an absolute shocker of a display. Like I had trouble getting my head around how bad what I was watching was on Saturday. And... I, I, while I do you know, always think the manager is the guy where the buck stops I will on this occasion absolutely say no I mean he didn't send those players out expecting that they couldn't fucking control a ball you know it looked like a three year old having a kick about in the garden with their dad some of the control but what I will say is that I do look at Kilmarnock especially and I'm not talking about Steve Clark for Rangers incidentally before anyone thinks that I'm just saying that I do look at Kilmarnock and the idea that 
well, it's just about players, there's nothing a manager can do, I don't buy, and I, I never really have, um, because they were a relegation team, and now they're not, now they're top six, and they've made it already, the top six has decided. Um, yet another exciting race in Scottish football. And I do look and think, this is what experienced, competent managers do with squads, they get them playing better than they look on paper. And there's not enough evidence yet, there will be by the end of the season, but Graham Murray has got to, he, he doesn't now have any wiggle room at all. He now has to pretty much win from now to the end of the season, I think, Cammy. So he does, but there isn't a person among the three of us who believe that that is possible. I'm, and I, I hate saying that. The thing is, it sounds like I'm probably having a go at Graham Marty here. I'm, I'm legitimately not. I think Graham, Graham Marty, the, the service and dedication he's given to that football club is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I've said before, and the point, in fact, all of us have said, I think I said for instances, the board have got, should do nothing other than give their everlasting thanks to Graham Murray for being able to manage the ship over this kind of period because of the Cranchard-esque speed of which they've been able to try and recruit a replacement manager. And the problem you've got with this scenario now, David, is we're now turning around and saying, yeah, we'd like to be able to try and see how we got on for this. We've still to go to Tynecastle for the first time this season because we haven't done that yet. We've got the piggery to be able to go to. And I think if I was to say to you and the majority of Rangers fans, of the nine home game or sorry, the nine points available from our home games from the end of the season, would you take a win in two draws or something along that nature? I think most Rangers fans would accept it. And that is that's that in itself is is inexcusable. And I think that there's there's got to be some points here where the players I don't believe the the players I don't believe the players think that there's a, there's a degree of accountability that falls in them because of what's happening with the managerial situation. I think it gives them more latitude to have this slightly easier approach. And what what annoys me is that when I see teams like Kilmarnock playing for each other and Motherwell, a 10-man Motherwell team being able to keep a clean sheet against Celtic, and I mean throwing everything at Celtic in terms of you know diving in front of balls, being able to do that... I think that there's been a point where we need to seriously look at how many leaders do we have on that part that when a shit hits the fan, we'll take that step up to be able to do that and harass the other players. I don't think we've got a strong enough manager to be able to do that as it currently stands. And I hate saying that because I would love Graham Murray to get that job permanently. I, I, I'm sorry, but my, my time is up. I'm not like you. I'm not giving him until the end of the season. I think even if he gets by his Scottish Cup semi-final and even if he wins the Scottish Cup, is thanks, Graham. You've done a great job. You've got a job for Rangers at life. I don't care what it is, but we need to bring in an experienced manager now who can get these players moving when the shit really hits the fan. We don't have a plan B. And that 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 will be his biggest downfall. And I'd like to echo that, David, just uh, uh, around, although I have made, made my mind up on, on Graham Murty, um, here's a guy <laughs> that was the under-20s coach um, and doing pretty well as the under-20s coach, incidentally. And he stepped up twice to steady the ship when, I think, uh, the way you put it there, Cammy, was spot on. Cranchar-esque pace from the board. Um, Especially the second time round when it was just an absolute fucking car crash farce. But he's done all right. And he wants to be the next manager permanently after the summer. Um, However... What we're effectively faced with is a guy learning his trade at Rangers when Rangers need an experienced, steady hand to get the players to run through brick walls for him. And I'm afraid he's just not that guy. You two are so fucking fickle. Two weeks ago, it was, oh, again, Murray's great. We're going to be 55's coming. No, listen to but, you. But David, but David, you know what? You know what? Listen, Ian's totally right. And the reason as to why he's right is because the three of us right now, if we could, would all give Graham Murray the job if he was getting better results. And what what frustrates all of us as, as Rangers fans is I, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I didn't think that we were back in the league title. I didn't think so. I think they were just stronger in terms of being able to try and be more consistent. But we're within touching distance 
of the last two old firm games, we should have taken at least four points. That's my viewpoint from that. So the gap is definitely closing. But again, I hate coming back to this. See beating Celtic. Beating Celtic doesn't win the league. But able to go away to Dens Park and get results on a shit night on Wednesday gets you um, the league. Well, I can't but fancy is to go away and get a result. It's at home. I don't have any fucking but, but, confidence. Yeah, but that's, in, but that's on top of your, your solid basis of home games, three points. Without question, home games, three points. And we mentioned in the pod a wee, a wee while ago, but I think, I can't remember whose miss it was. Um, it might have been Morelos again, but if that um, if that was away from home, he scores it. That's that's actually what it's like now, is that you can't be relied upon to be able to get points at home, and that's that's not good enough. It's not good enough for this Rangers team. No, it isn't, and unfortunately, it keeps happening, and that's what makes that's what makes it so difficult. I think to because there are good things, and I don't want to you know anyone to be listening to this and saying, "Ah, you're forgetting this, that, and the other." We're not. I mean. There are good things. There has been improvement. I did like the January window. I think that Mark Allen especially is coming out of this season with a lot of credit for someone who looks like a good appointment. And I think, you know, we'll save the board a wee bit in terms of having a 100% bad record in terms of appointments. But I do believe that the fans... You can't sell season tickets to fans... But you look, we've got a rump of people who are going to turn up, and it's the majority. It's you know thirty five thousand are going to buy season books regardless. But those kind of more, not quite as dedicated ones, the ones that are, have been buying them, those are the ones that are going to go. Nah, we keep getting fucked at home. I'm going to go and get. I'm going to get away tickets because you know it's better. It's more fun. And let's be honest, the match day experience at Ibrox isn't isn't anything at all. There was a really good point on followfollow dot com, Mark's website, that. Uh, you know, for instance, Bobby Russell comes on to do the halftime draw on Saturday. There's no video announcing who he is and you know pointing to his achievements. He just walks on. It's Bobby Russell, kind of half the stand that are there, give him a clap, and he goes away again. And that's everything at Ibrox. You know, the food's atrocious, and it all plays into the atmosphere. And I think that the board have concentrated a lot on the books and that's understandable and we've spoken about this before and they were right to and I'm glad but there's an awful lot of stuff needs fixed and when it's going well it masks it absolutely when we're picking up wins nothing else matters if Rangers are winning I get that but the run the risk you run when you're saying it doesn't matter so long as we're getting results is you need to be getting results and as soon as you stop getting results people notice things like it's a shit atmosphere the food's terrible um and you have to, the first thing you have to do at Rangers, the first thing you have to do at Rangers is get a team that competes at Ibrox, 100% you do, because it's our home and we take a special pride in it because we'll still be there in 10 years when none of these players are. And I think that the constant failure and stuttering form at home is, I think it, it's, it sours everything else, it spoils everything else. And when that happens and people get that sour taste in their mouth, that's when they start looking about and noticing all the other things and that's when people start moaning uh, and complaining and ranting and, and I can't blame them, I really can't because you know, that's what I'm sitting doing here just now as well and it is frustrating because I think that you know, last season Celtic were away up over the hill, there was nothing could be done about that, this year I've never got that feeling, they're not as good as they were last year and yeah, look, the, the argument is there and people can make it and say, well, OK, if we'd got another 12, 15 points, that would, Celtic wouldn't have been able to relax the way they can in certain matches and they would have got more points. And that's maybe true, right? But I'd like to have seen it anyway, you know? I'd like to have seen if that was the case. And I just can't help but feel, Hoggy, that all season we've continually shot ourselves in both feet. Um, yeah, shot ourselves or shot ourselves probably... What <laughs> one of the two or both on many occasions? I'll go back to we. Uh, can, um, you guys have talked about you know the, the 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 players, the formation. One of the biggest things for me is doing the basics well. We've talked about it umpteen times on this pod. On Saturday, you've mentioned passes going astray. Rangers try to get a goal and Kenny Miller passing it into the, the side netting. Positioning, not tracking runs, 
defenders not looking over their shoulders. It's just, that's all the basics. And Saturday was the perfect example of a team pretty much en masse doing the basics poorly. Um, then, you know, then you add in the five games lost since November, the seven games overall. I said earlier, all it takes is you turn three of those games into, three of those defeats into wins. You turn the two draws into wins. You know, a combination of them. And we are, pardon the pun, right up Celtic's arse. And they are under pressure. That is frustrating because Celtic are a good side, a decent side and a consistent side. But they're not a great side. And everything this season is on us. Everything is on us. I want us to be better. I want us to be better more consistently. And I'm afraid we've just not done it. We've not done it when it was there for us. You know, you, you, you look back in the cold light of day, this season we have actually had chance after chance after chance presented to us. Um, and we've pissed it away. The biggest compliment you can pay Graham Murray is if he was inept at what he was doing, he wouldn't be in the job that he's in right now. It's as simple as that. The the voice of the fans would have demanded that he go if he was unable to get results. And that, I think, is you're now in that almost that purgatory of we've been able to get results when maybe the, the you know the chips are against us, but there's been far too many dropped that should have been bread and butter. And that's where I, I think everybody everyone to a man, as far as I'm aware, is from a from a a, a, a network of Rangers fans, um, all believe Marty has done well given the circumstances. Again he's worked with Alan in January to be able to bring in some 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 decent signings, but there's a there's a gap, and as long as that gap is there, and predominantly it'll come down to experience, that's what's stopping them. And do you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. There, there is nothing. There's literally nothing wrong with that. You want to start looking at, you know, comparables. You could also say, you know, Zidane at Madrid is getting an unbelievable amount of leeway because of who he is, and domestically Madrid have been terrible. But at the same token. I don't believe that for a single minute a Real Madrid fan wouldn't, you know, always love Zinedine Zidane no matter what the inevitable outcome is going to be where he's going to lose his job. Murray will be in exactly the same position. And again, I'm being totally serious. I'm not a big fan of this. Jobs for the boys and all of that kind of stuff. Graham Murray deserves, in my opinion, constant employment at Ibrox in some capacity. The problem is, right now, at this point in time, the manager's job is beyond them. So two weeks... And uh, then we'll be back. Graham Dorans should be back in fit by then. Um, I don't think David Bates will. Uh, I don't know about Ross McCrory, but but Graham Dorans is back. How do we line up? What what's the difference that can be made in two weeks' time that we've missed out the last couple of weeks or the last couple of matches rather, Hoggy? Um. So let's 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 learn let's learn our lessons first and foremost. Teams are going to pack the midfield. We know that. So we need to go toe-to-toe. Um, I like I like Josh Windass as a player. Uh, never thought, I never actually thought I'd hear myself say that. I quite like Josh Windass as a player. However, in the role that Marty's given him as pretty much second striker who doesn't really track back and doesn't defend, um, there's almost a kind of luxury we're going to have to do without because... Josh Windass currently is not a good enough player to build a Rangers team around, which is a, in, in the role that he's playing is pretty much what we're asking Murty to do. Uh, and it's leaving us woefully short. We need to go three solid in midfield. It means either Windass is out or Windass plays up top on his own um, and Morelos and Cummings are out. One, one, you know, or Cummings plays, whatever it is. But we're playing with one striker. We're playing with the two guys out wide. We probably a wee bit more advanced, but lots and lots of tracking back. For me, that's the key. We're effectively going four three two one um, or four five one because we've got to match up to teams who are effectively going to come and just try and bully us. Tammy, 
I, so I would I would steer more towards a four five one, um, purely because I think that um, Candace and Murphy can really hurt us, uh, uh, hurt teams from what they are capable of doing on the flank. Um, I would remove Windass from that equation. Um, potential look at if we need to rotate it and bring him on as a sub to replace one of those midfielders if we are chasing the game I think Morelos has to start up front um, my heart bleeds for him because I know that he has had a long continual playing turn um, I, I think if we were to incorporate Cummings into some sort of that fold then I think it has to change again and I think we could even consider if we had to buy another striker and the close window, and let's say we sign Cummings permanently, I would probably buy someone with a bit of height. I don't want to revert it back to a Haitley McCoyst, Perso Novo type partnership, but for me, that's the kind of thing that Cummings would thrive on. Um, I think Morelos is physical enough to be able to play in a 4 5 1 up top on his own. Um, and then if you've got a holding midfielder, uh, potentially Windass, and then potentially another offensive central midfielder, you've also then got. Um, power coming in from the flanks as well uh, Tavernier coming in to be able to cross over because Candace can come in to the middle as well and then try and take it from there so that gives you some degree options but again I, I agree with you and I think you've got to pack that midfield and, and open up a bit I, I just and listen do you know what I would sign Jason Cummings I would because Alan McCoy was shite when he was 22 as well so do you know what I would do I would get Cummings because I think he's an investment um, I think he has got goals in the top flight. So I think we need to try and find out how to best support him. Um, if Morelos isn't going to be here long term, then OK, fair enough. Uh, but I definitely think with Morelos, it's a 4-5-1. I think if we're going to start Cummings, then I think we maybe need to consider playing one uh, behind him or alongside him. I would also, David... Um on the three so mentioned specifically, Graham Dorans and Ross McCrory. Uh, I think Ross McCrory showed up better in central midfield, but I think needs must as well. I think Ross McCrory's got to go into the back line. Uh, he's probably... He, so, you talked about Bruno Alves earlier. Bruno Alves was always going to be a risk. Being 35, 36, we were hoping for a David Weir-esque performance and we didn't get it. Saturday for me showed Bruno Bruno Alves is done. There's more chance of me playing for Portugal I think at the Euros than him uh, but he's done. He was letting, uh, letting balls bounce that he should be attacking. He was attacking balls that he shouldn't be going for and he does, he, he's got this Cammy, you picked up on it earlier. Players are running at him. He backs off, backs off and backs off and then attempts a tackle in the penalty area. It, it, it's it's almost as if he's forgotten defending school. So he has to move out, and I think McCrory, by necessity, has to move into the back line, which makes Dorans the third man in, in, in the field. There's nothing... So the, th- the thing is, though, in an ideal world, what I would do is have Alves... Because you've got to remember in the comparison with David Weir, typically if Beguera or Queller were playing alongside David Weir, those guys would be the ones who would make the first engaging tackle when players were running towards them. David Weir kind of organised and mopped up because he realised he didn't have the pace to be able to see but what he did have was the footballing brain to anticipate what was coming towards him so in an ideal world Alves could have done that with Bates or McCrory and that would have been great because McCrory or Bates are then making the tackles for those players that are running towards him because again they have got the physical fitness um, and youth that if you are looking to run at them and cut inside or be able to move the ball a yard to be able to create a pass or an opportunity or whatever those guys are quick enough to snuff that out Alves dictates what the back four do. That hasn't happened, and I would not give Alves any more time. I, I agree with you, and I think he's done. Um, I, I don't know who that replacement is. I, I know we spoke about uh, Berra potentially. I don't see a reason as to why we would leave Hearts and potentially we'd buy him, but if we're going to go down that road of experience again for the centre halves, then we need to think very carefully about who that person is because they need to feature regularly. OK, folks, well, uh, as you know, it's an international break, uh, as discussed, and that means that the pod does continue with a slightly different format. This Thursday's Heart and Hand Extra will come to you if 
you ask me some questions because it's another one of the Q&As that seem to go down quite well. If you do want to send me a question, go to our Facebook page, just search for Heartland Rangers Podcast and uh, put a question up there, look at any of the threads, add a question in there. Or if you're on the Twitter, you can use the hashtag HHPod, that's HHPod, and ask your question. Or if you follow me already, just tag me in it. Um, but using that means I can gather them all together. If I get enough questions, then you'll get a pod on Thursday. If not, then you'll get a five-minute pod as I come on and say you didn't ask me enough questions and maybe sing a song or something. Um, now, lads, we uh, on our Patreon site... Uh, oh, and I should probably tell everyone that uh, if you've been thinking about maybe signing up to the Patreon site but you're not sure, there is a free show available. And, uh, it, again, it's on my Twitter and it's on the Heart and Hand Facebook page, one of our Advocate Year shows, so you can go along and have a listen to that. But on the Patreon site last night, Hoggy and I started a show uh, called Football Room 101, which was obviously things that we don't like about football that should get sent in. And we did a few, Hoggy, and I still had a couple left over, so I thought I would ask you boys for another one tonight. Things that, that went in last night are modern squad numbers, you know, like guys that are number 99 or 67 at a club not too far from us. Uh, it's stats that mean nothing. Uh, Liverpool FC's Nivea advert. All of them went into Football Room 101. So I want you all to, to think of one, and I'll go first to give you time. Uh, obviously, you're not allowed Neil Lennon, Cammy. This is too obvious. Well, that's, that's poor. That's yeah, poor. Cammy just suddenly scores one out uh, <laughs> and puts in another one. And Sco- sc- scores scores the only one he'd written down. Out. Yeah, but five times he'd, he'd run up. Now there's all all kinds of different ones here, but uh, I'm going to go with one that does apply to us, but also applies to all football. Goal music, I fucking hate it. What is the point of it? Just let the fans cheer and sing, and sometimes it's so inappropriate. Like when they played it after Kenny Miller scored against Celtic to make it four one. And they played the goal music and it just made the Tims laugh even more. But goal music in general, just no need for it. Let us cheer and then we'll sing a song. But I think it kills the chances of getting a song going because there's this fucking music blaring. And Hoggy and I on the Advocate Years remember the time when Lionel Charbonnier, they actually started playing the Marseillaise when he made a save until he actually asked them to stop doing it. Um, something that's completely out of control, and that would go into my football room one hundred and one. Hoggy, uh, yeah, I go along with that. Um, what really? Uh, so I get goal music if it's a kind of almost sing along for the crowd. There's a, I, I, as as Cami pointed out the other week, the the club soon t- to be formerly known as Dundee United uh, do the you know beautiful Sunday type thing, and of course all all the all the fans, I say. Sorry, the, the what? The beautiful Sunday. Ah, whatever the fuck it's called. You know the one. Um, no. <laughs> or, or, or perhaps you don't. But anyway, this song that Dundee United sing along to, all fourteen of the fans, they play that. They sing along fine. We, we, we end up playing some rubbish that just dampens the dampens the crowd down. It's just, it's, Let's it's, be honest. It's, it's done it. It's done at Ibrox to stop us singing the Belly Boys. Well, true. That's why they do it. Anyway, Cammy. Um, so mine, so mine's is probably a bit sombre. Oh, um, fuck. But when, um, so, so I hate, so I hate a minute's applause. Despise the idea uh, for when people have obviously passed away. Um, I think that there's some very, very seldom occasions in which it could be used. Um. So I prefer a minute silence. I think a, a, a minute's reflection is something which is really, you know, quite poignant. I think there's something within that. What I despise is when the mascots stand alongside <laughs> the teams. I, uh, with their hands uh, up on the last footballer. Well, with that whole... Because obviously with mascots and stuff, they don't talk. So like it's all that kind of big waving thing and the gestures and stuff. And all you see... And I think the the, the really famous one is like uh, Gunnar Soros, who is Arsenal's one, kind of just standing with its head slightly bowed, um, just in this kind of moment of thought. And you're like, what the fuck are you doing? Go and just stand off to the side of the park and don't bother, you know, getting involved in this. It's not like it's just a minute. That's all you have to do. 
and then after that the game will start. You can spend 45 minutes prior to that fucking about all over the park and doing what you like. Um, but I hate this idea of mascots joining in with a minute silence. That to me just drives me mental. Mascots, um, mas- mascots themselves could actually go into room one hundred and one. I, I, I've, I've long held the belief, um, and it might be, it might be wrong. Who knows? But I've, I've long held the belief that mas- people who want to be football mascots should immediately go on the sex offenders register because it just saves time. <laughs> <laughs> the other one the other one for me is um, when footballers and it's, it's more probably prevalent down south and stuff but when footballers uh, cover their mouths as they're talking to each other um, to obviously foil lip readers so I was watching a Man United game on Saturday night and Lukaku was coming off with someone I can't remember who it was and he's basically covering his mouth and talking to him and you see a lot of players doing it if they're on the bench or whatever and, and they're, they're obviously talking about it. And the thing is, what I don't get about this, right, is how it's going to cause a major stir when Lukaku like, just turns around and goes, I fucking hate that guy. I've, I've never really liked him for fear of the fucking, I don't know, the Sunday Mail running with it or some sort of big massive exclusive that a footballer talks shit about an opponent or something like that. No one cares. It's a sport and you're not... You know, you're not going to give away anything amazing by saying that Lukaku's probably saying, "Do you fancy get out tonight to smash some birds or something like that?" Yeah. It's not. I think I get it not. if they're going to, if they're coming off or they're, or they're on the part and they're about to say, you know, Jose Mourinho sucks dogs cocks. Right, I get, I get that that they might want to keep that private. But if they're just saying things like, "I'm a bit tired," or as you say. Let's you know. Let's go to the dancing. Then it's it's strictly unnecessary. But there's so much about about modern football you can put in. I I come back to those fucking Nivea adverts with Liverpool players that just make me want to stab myself in the eye. Um, I, and have as as a metrosexual, you know, as a moisturising using man, and not just for wanking. Right, I use lotion and not just for wanking. I'm sure I've got. I'm sure I must have it on a phone somewhere. I'm sure I've got a photo. Of you do not have a photo of me old, wanking. No, no, I've got a photo of your old bathroom. Yes, and you seem to have a problem of buying one of a particular product. You must buy three or four of them. Yes, I because don't. and this is this is a true story, listeners. He did have like his uh, I don't know what you call it, like a kind of work top type idea. It was a big, uh, the way the, it was an old, uh, it was like a Victorian flat townhouse, and yeah. uh, the the bathroom had this like big, uh, I suppose like a dressing table built in. It's like a, like a marble thing. Yeah, in front of the mirror. Yeah, yeah. and it was absolutely and, covered in all the stuff I use because I worry about running out. I still do this, so instead of buying like one. Type it, like one of the deodorants I use, I buy eight, and when it gets to four, I'll replenish, and that way I never run out. Yeah, but no one, no one runs out of shower gel, David, when they're down to like the fourth bottle. Like, no, I know you get half a bottle left, then you're at risk of running out. Exactly, and you're I never, like, I never like get, the, to, I never the, get the, to that stage. It's like the Jack Nicholson thing of uh, as good as it gets. You know, when he opens up the mirror and like in the the cabinet in the bathroom. And he just opens up a new soap, washes his hands once, throws the whole thing in the bin. That's what it was like. No, I, I, uh, so. I used to do that with socks. Um, <laughs> I used to do that with socks. I would wear them once and throw them away. But um, I don't think it's any revelation to you guys that I'm a nutter. Um, Cameron, tell them the story about you trying to visit me last week. Oh, that was... <laughs> Jesus. I, I would have been quicker trying to organise an appointment with a, uh, with a queen. Um, just been well, able Scott? To no, no, Scott would just have let you come through. Yeah, Scott would have just, he would have kept the door open for a week. Um, horrendous, absolutely horrendous. We were trying to get uh, the season ticket off you. And David wanted to post it and I was kind of hesitant because of the weather and what have you. And I thought, well, if it runs out, and I was getting it because David was going to wait. And so I was like, well, I don't want to not get it. And then he's in London and then he's going to go through the arse ache. So this is also my thought process. I was, I don't want David to go through the arse ache of having to get a paper ticket printed. And then I realised, David won't do any of that. So he'll be like, well, fuck it, mate. Sorry, I can't do any of it. So that's your plums. Because uh, you are quite lazy. When you mm-hmm. have to be, you can be quite lazy. Oh, yeah. And so we'd, we'd organise. I said, like, I'll come over and get it. Bit of a distance, but I'll come and get it because I just want to make sure that it's safe and what have you. And, you know, it'd be nice to see you. Do you know, and I don't really get to see you as often as I would like to. And then I said, right, OK, I'll be over about 11. And you point blank refused. You're like, I won't be up for 11. No, I wouldn't. 
Um, I'm not, I this think happens. This this happens when you're on the professional scrap heap. Of course. And uh, I was like, well, Sally be in. You know, like, well, yeah, Sally will be in. And true to your word, go over there. Sally opened the door. Two dogs attacked me. And then she has to then shout you down to be able to come down. And then Hugh Hefner of Ayrshire comes down the stairs in a jobby coloured dressing no, gown. No, 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 it was grey. I don't think it's grey, it's, I think it's... it's a, wait, maybe, it was maybe grey once. It's a grey, Tommy, uh, because I have different... Uh, again, I've got six different robes and I keep them all in different <laughs> rooms. So, yes. Uh, no, no, look... I'm mental, I don't like leaving the house and therefore I make sure that everything that I like is in every room um, just in case, uh, you know, you never know I might get locked in, it's unlikely but I might I might get locked in um, but yeah, I wasn't going to put clothes on when I was going back to bed I absolutely believe if Sally hadn't been in, what you would have done is just slid I would, the I, I would have just under the door I actually took, uh, took the season ticket up with me because I was going to just chuck it out the window to you <laughs> And it was on my nightstand, and then when when the doorbell went, I was going to get up, see you go, hey, yeah, chuck it, and then go back to bed. Um, but yeah. instead, you and Sally combined to make me get up and come and see you, um, which I thought was really fucking offside. And then he's like, well, I've driven all the way from Livingston to Ayrshire, and I'm like, I, I would have posted it. But uh, yeah, not not big on visitors. Now, lads, we're not just here to to entertain and to break down Rangers games. We're also here to sell shit, and people can now get their hands on the Heart and Hand T-shirt. Uh, if they visit heartandhand.co.uk and it is a very very there are two very very nice t-shirts more will be added soon but if you want to support the pod this is a lovely way to do it if you don't don't but don't moan and say oh you know you're stealing my money I'm really not if I could steal your money I wouldn't have to do shit like this um, this is me actually trying to just get money from you it's a different thing it's not stealing it's what is it it's a uh, hawking that's what it is not Stephen, but Hawking. Selling um, your wheels. Selling my wheel, that's it, right. And uh, this is a lot less painful than selling my arse and hopefully a bit more lucrative. Heartandhand.co.uk, get your hands in a t-shirt. When it comes to live shows, we are very, very, very close to announcing the rearranged in Fernland date. And keep your eyes peeled for a summer one with a special guest, and it's not KT. Eh? Eh? People that think I only know one footballer. Um... And it will be getting announced soon for Glasgow, so please keep keep your eyes on the prize. Uh, of course, if you want to hear more from us, go to patreon.co.uk forward slash heart and hand. Uh, sorry, patreon.com forward slash heart and hand. And there are at least three new shows up every day, uh, all the Rangers that you can handle. Okay, dope folks, I'd like to thank our, our sponsors today, Maitland & Co. Uh, if you visit them at just maitlandandco.net, that's maitlandandco.net for all your legal needs. And I'll thank our executive producers in London, Mr. Mike Lee and Mr. Paul Miles. My guest tonight, the wonderful Mr. Cameron Bell, who's welcome any time that I'm in London. It's a pleasure to speak to you boys. Uh, love and hugs to you both. And of course, the effervescent Mr Ian Hogg. As ever, a pleasure. Well, maybe not so much a pleasure. Pleasure to talk to you boys. Difficult subjects tonight, but uh, all good fun. Thanks again. My name's David Edgar, and if I get a lot of questions from you using the hashtag HHPod, I'll talk to you again on Thursday. Till then, bye.